love it, that even though we are strangers, that with the love of Christ in our hearts, we can all be one, and it's, we're all just one family in God's sight. And I just thank God for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I'm blessed to see how many children are in the congregation, and I just encourage you to bring your children even through the evening services during the week, because we just love to have children in our services. But I just have one request. If you bring children to the service, that you'll make a vow to God to also bring them to the altar when you come. Because I just believe the children need to be here in the presence of God. They need to know what the altar is for, to come and seek the face of Jesus. They need to see what God is doing, how people can fall under the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. They need to see others being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Because when they see someone else tasting and seeing that the Lord is so good, makes them hungry too. They need to see what God can do. And, and I believe even the tiniest children have needs in their lives that only God can meet. And sometimes they can't express them. They can't even tell their mom and dad. But Jesus knows, and Jesus wants to minister to the little children, too. So please bring them with you, and bring them with you to the altar as well. Praise God. Now, I'm just thankful for all the talents that are in this church, all the singing and the musical abilities. Uh, sad to say, I don't have any talents like that. All I seem to be able to do is talk. And my husband figures that most women are pretty good at that. <laughs> so I try to share for the glory of God. So I'm just going to share for a bit before my husband comes with the sermon tonight. What various hindrances we meet in coming to the mercy seat. Yet those who know the power of prayer have great desire to be often there. Prayer makes the darkened cloud withdraw. Prayer climbs the ladder Jacob saw, gives exercise to faith and love, brings every blessing from above. In ceasing to pray, we cease to fight, for it's prayer that makes our armor bright. And Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. O oh Lord, increase our faith and love, that we may all thy goodness prove, and gain from thy abundant store the fruits of prayer forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank the Lord for prayer, that we can talk to our God as friend with friend. And several years ago, God opened my eyes in a very special way to the power of prayer. It was April 1982. I was just finishing my second year in university, and throughout the term I'd been doing volunteer work in the university hospital in the children's ward. Now, I was going through to get my teaching degree, but ever since I was a teenager, I've always done some kind of volunteer work with disabled children. So when my classes at school would be over, I'd just cross the street to the hospital and go and be with the children. I'd play with them, try to make them laugh, and hug them when they needed to be hugged. And I tried to show them the love of God. Now the two boys I was working with had fully recovered and been sent home. And as I walked down the hall to the nurse's station, I began to wonder who my next patient might be. My supervisor took me to the room of a little girl. We stood at the bottom of her bed. She had long brown hair. Her skin was so pale, it was almost transparent. Her tiny body was so frail, lying so perfectly still, as if she were sound asleep. But she wasn't sleeping. Paula was in a coma. She was just six years old. While playing with a friend, she'd been hit by a car. The doctors had expected her to regain consciousness within 24 hours of the accident. And now several weeks had already passed by, and she was still in a deep, life-threatening coma. 
The doctors just shook their heads. There was nothing more they could do for her except to wait and see what would happen. My supervisor asked point blank if I thought I could handle working with a child who might die at any moment. And honestly, I, I didn't know if I could handle it or not. Well then, did I want to work with her? And I looked at her again. And she was so innocent, so helpless. And I thought, how can I say no? And I don't think any one of you could have said no either. The next day I went and I spent about 30 minutes with Paula, slowly moving her arms and legs and reading to her. But I left with a heavy burden and a sense of despair. The doctors had determined that Paula had suffered brain damage and was totally paralyzed on one side of her body. If by a slim chance she ever did pull out of the coma, she would have a loss of memory, speech problems, permanent paralysis, and perhaps other complications. It just wasn't there. She was only six years old. Even if she did regain consciousness, what kind of life did she have to look forward to? And I'll tell you that my thoughts would switch back and forth from wanting her to come out of the coma to thinking she just might be better off if she never did. A couple of days went by, and I was too busy with my exams to go to the hospital. But one afternoon as I was studying, my mind wandered to thoughts of Paula. And such a heavy burden came over me. Tears just flooded my eyes and I fell upon my knees. My whole body just seemed to heave and shake. And I cried with all my might unto the Lord for little Paula. And how I thank God that I am filled with the Holy Ghost and I speak in other tongues. For as it says in Romans 8.26, in my sorrow, I didn't know how to pray for her as I should. But the Holy Spirit himself interceded through me with sighs too deep for words. And I don't know how much time had passed. I just became lost in the Spirit of God. Then the Lord in his mercy chose to reveal something to me. I never asked him to do it. It was given by his sovereign will. Now, it could be called a vision. And yet, at the same time, it was so real that I had the sense of actually being there while it was happening. I was standing in one of the corridors of the hospital. And I was looking about, and I said, Lord, I know two people in this hospital. Who is it that I am to go to? And something began to draw me down the hallway. I could see all of the nurses and the patients, but they didn't see me. I entered a room. It was Paula's room. I walked quietly to her bedside and ever so gently picked her up. As soon as she was secure in my arms, we seemed to leave the earth, floating upward, higher and higher. Then, there in the clouds, my eyes beheld a man, dressed in a white spotless robe. The love and glory of God just shone all about him. And I knew this was Jesus. This was my Savior. Without saying a word, I approached him. And when I got close enough, I extended my arms to him with Paula still lying across them. And Jesus reached out with his right hand so gently touched her on the forehead and he spoke three words he said she is healed she is healed and that's all he said and I longed to stay but in silence with Paula still in my arms we began to gently fall down and down until we were back in the hospital room and I laid Paula back in her bed the next moment, I was aware of being in my apartment again, only I wasn't crying anymore. I was thanking and praising God. Now, as soon as I grasped what had taken place, I immediately went to the telephone and I called the hospital. Such was my faith. And I asked the nurse how Paula was, and she said, she's just the same. I said, are you sure? 
She said, I just came from her room. She's just the same. As I hung up that phone, I knew that no matter what the circumstances seemed, I had to hang on first to God's word. Exodus 15, 26. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And then secondly, I had to hang on to what God had shown me. Over the next few days, I made frequent visits to Paula, often staying for three and four hours at a time. And I told her all about Jesus. I read the scriptures to her about his birth, his miracle, his sacrificial death, and his glorious resurrection. I read the healing scriptures to her again and again and again. I'd brush her hair and sing to her hymns, choruses, songs in the spirit. I'd hold her hands and pray. And many a time I'd hear one of the nurses come and stand in the doorway behind me. They'd stand there for quite a while. And I'd just keep singing or praying. Not once did they ever intervene or stop me. But one thing that I said over and over was, Paula, you are healed now. Jesus has healed you. But no one will know unless you talk. You must talk, Paula, and show them you really are healed. I had such a joy when I went to visit that girl. And as the days slipped by, my faith stayed strong. Some of the staff couldn't figure out how I could remain so calm and cheerful while working with a comatose child, a child who was probably going to die. But you see, I had the assurance of the thing I'd hoped for. I had the evidence, even though I could see it yet with my eyes. And that's what faith is all about, isn't it? That's faith. Even though we don't see it yet, we still believe God's promise to be true. Now, I thank the Lord for all the times He has answered our prayers instantly. Doesn't it amaze you that sometimes the Lord answers your prayer almost before you finish whispering your heart's cry to Him? But you know, instant is only one of the ways God works. In those times when the answer does not come quickly, it is then that we must persevere in our faith, persevere in our praying, refusing to let doubt enter in, refusing to give up in despair and defeat. You know, there's a teaching that's come through the church that just says if it doesn't come instantly, then maybe it's not for you. Maybe you're not special enough and God doesn't want to do it for you. Just maybe you don't have enough faith. But instant is just one way. And I think we need to get back to the old ways of persevering. To come to the altar of God five minutes isn't good enough to come and hang on to the horns of the altar and say, God, I'm not leaving here till I hear from heaven. I'm going to persevere in my praying. I'm going to persevere in my faith. I'm not giving up, God. I'm not going to give up. I wept and I prayed on Paula's behalf. I held fast to the promises of God. And I tried to keep that flame of faith alive and burning in my heart. Do you know what happened? One day I came into the hospital. While I was speaking to a nurse, one of the therapists came running up to me and she said, Jane, you're not going to believe this, but yesterday I was reading a book to Paula and in the middle of the story, while I was trying to turn the page, Paula spoke and she said, and then, as if wanting to know what came next in the story. <laughs> and that was all she had said. Well, I went immediately to where Paula was and they had her sitting up in a wheelchair, and they had her strapped in, and that was the first time I'd seen her sitting up. Now, I was thrilled to hear her voice, but her speech was rather slurred, and it seemed she just kept within a haze and drifting in and out of reality. And in my heart, I just thought, God, I know you're not going to leave her like this. I know that you're going to complete the work that you've begun in her little life. And it didn't take long. The following day, she spoke even more. She became a chatterbox, and I listened with joy as I recall, heard her recall in detail events from her past. With my own ears, I heard her speak as clearly and plainly as any six-year-old, 
So now with just a bit of help, she was starting to walk on her own. Praise God. Praise God, her memory was perfect. Her speech was perfect. The paralysis was leaving her body. Paula was not only alive, but she was healed, just like Jesus said she would be. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You see, there's power in God's Word. If Jesus says something, you can count on it to be true. Amen? He said heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never, never, ever pass away. Now, on my next visit, I spent some time singing and praying with Paula. That turned out to be the last time I was to see my dear little friend. When I came the next afternoon, I discovered that the doctors had examined her and said that there was no reason to keep her in the hospital any longer. And her mother and father had already come to pick her up and take her home. Now, I was happy that she was well and could be released. But there was also a little disappointment in me because that day I had come bounding into her room with my camera. I was going to take her picture. I had all kinds of questions to ask her, and her bed was empty. They hadn't warned me that she was going to be released, and because I was just a volunteer, we weren't allowed to have any contact with the patients once they left the hospital. So they wouldn't give me her last name, her address, her telephone number. Little Paula just vanished out of my life. And I felt a little sad and a little bit empty, but I thought, what a precious time. In this one experience, I receive but a small taste of the wondrous things that are wrought by the power of prayer and the mercy of God. In Hebrews 5, 7, it says, In the days of his flesh, during the days when Jesus walked upon this earth, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and with tears. You see, there is no easy route, no shortcut, to the deeper, miracle-working life in Christ Jesus. But though the way may not be easy, it's very, very simple. It's simple. Second Chronicles 7.14 tells us the way. And I know this is a familiar scripture, but I just pray that it will start to grip our hearts because this is God's way to miracle, God's way to revival. If my people who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways. Then, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. We need to humble ourselves, begin to really pray and seek the face of God. Turn away from the wicked things of this world. Put on the holiness of Christ and earnestly, fervently pray. Maybe you're one of the real fortunate ones in this world who doesn't have a pressing need in your life right now. But so many others do. And they need you. They're counting on you. Just like Paula counted on me to pray for her. When I look back, I wonder... What would have ever happened to that little girl if on that day when that burden came upon me, I'd said, but Lord, I have such an important exam tomorrow, I just don't have time to pray. What would have happened? The Spirit of God would have lifted from me and gone to the next Christian and said, will you pray for this child? Maybe the next Christian was too busy. The Spirit of God would have lifted and gone to the next one and the next one and says, I have a dying child. Will you pray for her? I need someone to pray and intercede. But they're all too busy, all too tired, all too deafened to the Spirit's call. What would have happened to that little child? Now, I can't pretend that I'm always that obedient or that sensitive. But I am so thankful that on that particular day, I said, yes, Lord. I'll make time. You can use me. And I wonder how many people beyond these walls 
are lost in their sin. How many are sick and suffering. How many this very night are lying on their deathbed. They're just teetering on the brink of eternity. And God is looking for someone who will pray for them. He's searching for someone to stand in the gap between the living and the dead. And he's pleading, won't you pray? Won't you pray? Are you one who's available? Are you? Or are you always too busy? Always too tired? Too selfish? I wonder how many people have descended to the torment of hell? How many remain ill? How many remain in bondage? Because we, God's people, have neglected our Lord. We've neglected Him. And because our hearts have grown hardened towards Him, our ears have grown deaf to His call and His urgings in our spirit, we don't hear that still, small voice of the Holy Ghost anymore. We no longer hear the desperate cries coming from the hearts of the people who cross our paths daily. Lost people are crossing your path every day, and their heart is crying out for help. And we need to, to, to be bathed in prayer so we can be sensitive to that cry, so we can feel the Spirit urging us to go and speak and minister to that particular one to share God's word with them. People all around us are hurting. They're broken and suffering. They're crying out to see a God who is alive. A God who cares. A God who still can do miracles today. But I believe that it's up to the people of God. It's up to you and I. That means that we need to come together in oneness of the Spirit. In perfect harmony in one accord and begin to earnestly, fervently pray, to launch out in faith in our prayers, and let our spirit rise up on the wings of faith to touch God for those who are in need. There we are surrounded by real people with real problems, and they need deliverance, and only the hand of God can deliver them. And God wants to use you to be his instrument of deliverance. He wants to use each one of us to be his hand to touch those who are in need. We need to yield to the Spirit of God, abandon ourselves, let him come in his own special way, in his strength and his power. We can be yielded vessels, cleansed vessels, for his power to move through and bring deliverance to those who are in need. And I believe that when we do join together in that one accord, when we do begin to earnestly, fervently pray, when we will abandon ourselves to the Spirit of God, then we are going to see the things that our hearts long for. People coming in off the street and running to the altar to get saved. Beautiful miracles of healing and deliverance. The rushing mighty wind of the Holy Ghost sweeping over us. And the glory of God filling this sanctuary like a cloud. Hallelujah. If we shall but humble ourselves and pray, if we'll press in and seek the Lord, if we'll fervently pray with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, it takes strength to pray, it takes strength to intercede. If we'll weep and intercede, then God promises. He promises that he'll turn all of that mourning, all of our weeping, into victory and rejoicing. Hallelujah. I thank God for the victory in Christ Jesus. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And oh, all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Let's believe God for a flood of salvation, for a flood of healing, for a flood of deliverance. Let's fervently pray and believe God for a flood of victory in our midst. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God.
Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Now just share that by tonight, Paula would be about 15 or 16 years old. I just said to the Lord that I'm going to keep sharing her story and believe that one day a lovely young lady is going to step out of the congregation and come and say, I'm Paula. What a wonderful reunion that's going to be. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Let's just praise God for a while. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus is a miracle worker, isn't He? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful what God can do. If we'll just believe, open ourselves up to God and believe. It's wonderful what God can do. Isn't it? Hallelujah. 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 In the foyer, we have some for literature. A little newsletter. It's called Harvest Time. If you'd like to receive this by mail, there's a sheet of paper on that table in the back where you can write your name and address and we'll send it to you absolutely free of charge. We try to publish it about four times a year and you'll be reading some of the things that we take place in our meetings and testimonies and kind of keep track of what we're doing and where we're going and you get some idea of what we're trying to do for God. Just pick those up after the service. Then a little track, which road are you traveling? A good salvation track talks about the street and the narrow road that leads to heaven and the broad road that leads to hell. And this little book, The Baptism of the Holy Spirit, is it real? And all this literature is absolutely free of charge. A young man picked this book up in a Sunday morning service, read it in the afternoon, came back at night and God filled them with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. A young lady in Teague, that's two weeks ago, she's about 30 years old. She wanted to be filled with the Holy Ghost. She came Sunday morning to the altar. She never received the Holy Spirit. She came Sunday night. She was a little bit discouraged. She never received the Holy Ghost. She came back Monday night, came to the altar, and God baptized her with the Holy Ghost. And she said afterwards, she said, every time I came to the altar, I just felt I was getting closer and closer to receive. You see, don't give up. If you want something from God, keep on coming. Keep on coming. Do like you do at home when you're hungry. You come back to the table. You come back to the table. Breakfast, noon, and night. You keep on coming. Keep on coming to the altars. And you'll see that God will do something for you. Keep on coming. Keep on coming. Get a hunger inside. And you'll see that God's going to do something for you this week. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. A lady, a pastor's wife in North Dakota... We were there for a crusade, and she said to me, I like the way you give your altar call, she said. It's like that you ring out the table, and then you invite everybody to come to the altar and eat. Isn't that a good description? You see, the Word of God, God is a table spread where the saints of God are fed. There's a great table that you can come and eat from. When you come to the altar... That's the place where God works that into you. You hear His Word. You come to the altar and let God work in your soul. Praise the Lord. My message tonight is entitled, God Can Do It Again. 
How many believe he can? He can do it again and again and again. He's the same God today as he always has been. Yesterday and today and forever the same. There's no reason to doubt that he can do it again. Yesterday and today and forever the same. There's no reason to doubt that he can do it again. The Bible says that one day Jesus was passing by. He saw a blind man. A man had been blind from birth. His disciples asked him, they said, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that is born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither if this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. What are the works of God? What did Jesus do in his earthly ministry? What kind of a ministry did he have? The Bible tells us in Acts 10, verse 38, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. The devil had oppressed the people and trodden them down with sin, sickness, fear, and torment. But Jesus came doing good. He brought forgiveness peace and joy. He brought healing, health and victory. He brought the blessings of God into people's lives. Praise the Lord. And Jesus spat on the ground and he made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And he went his way and washed and came back seeing. When the people saw the man who'd been blind, walking by himself, with perfect vision, they gathered round him, and they said, How were your eyes open? How come now you can see? And he answered, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed my eyes with the clay, and said, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received my sight. Praise the Lord. When the Pharisees heard the man had been healed, they said, Give God the glory. We know this man is a sinner because he heals on the Sabbath day. Give God the glory. And the man who had been blind answered, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. But one thing I know, that was I was blind, now I can see. Hallelujah. And the Bible says they cast them out of the temple. When Jesus found him, he said, You believe in the Son of God? And he answered, Who is he that I might believe? And Jesus said, You're talking to him right now. And the man answered, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Thank God the man's eyes had been opened. His spiritual and physical eyes had been opened to see Jesus. The Bible tells us that when Jesus walked the sandy shores of Galilee, he opened the eyes of the blind. He made the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak, and the maimed were made whole. And I believe if God has done something once, he can do it again. If he's ever done it once, he will do it again. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's never changed. Same yesterday and today and forever. Tonight, I want to share with you a story. A true story from the 20th century. It's a testimony of my mom and my dad. It's a testimony of the love the mercy, the grace, and the power of God. I want you to go back with me to the early 1920s, to a small community in Norway called Ethnodal. That's where mom and dad were born. When my mom was a very young lady, before she was married, she became very ill. She suffered with a recurring fever. It would strike her again 
and again and again and again. She became very weak. She went to the best doctors possible, tried every tablet and medicine known, but nothing seemed to help. After six years of suffering, one day a little magazine came in the mail. It told of two men who had started a healing home in a city, distant city in Norway. It told how they were praying for the sick, and God was performing mighty miracles. This mom read the magazine, things started to rise in her heart at this same Jesus who had saved her, forgiven her, cleansed her, and washed her sins away, could also stretch out his hand and heal and strengthen and make her whole. The Bible says in James 5, verses 14 and 15, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. And if you've committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And mom believed, mom believed according to this scripture, if she could get to that place and receive prayer, that God would make her well. Mom was too weak and sick to travel alone. Her brother went with her. When she arrived at the healing home, she discovered there were many sick folk there. Many of them were desperately ill and given up to die. Nurses were on duty night and day, helping the sick and suffering. And Mom said early in the morning, she heard these two men upstairs praying and crying out to God to send His presence, to send His power, to mercy upon the sick the suffering, and the dying. During the day, they shared the Word of God with the people. They prayed with them, encouraged them, anointed them with oil in the name of the Lord. The healing home was situated right next to the ocean. They didn't have running water and bathrooms like we have today, but they had bathhouses. These bathhouses were built right onto the ocean. The water from the ocean came under the wall into the bathhouse. And one day the nurse came to the women and said, It's time for you to go down to the ocean and have a bath. The mom turned to the nurse and said, I could never do that. He said it was in the springtime of the year, and the water was still very cold. And mom said, If I go into that cold water, I'll get desperately ill. The nurse gave mom the key. I said, just go and trust God. Mom went with the other women, opened the door into the bathhouse. The women took the clothes off, went down the steps into the cold water. And Mom was standing on the floor all alone by herself, wondering in her heart to God, should I go into the water or should I not? Now she stood there wondering in her heart to God whether she should go into the water or not. Something like electricity hit her on the one shoulder. And a warm, beautiful feeling went all the way down throughout her body. Mom was startled. She looked around. There was nobody close by. There were no electrical cords in the building. And then she realized that this must be the hand of God. This must be God's presence. This must be Jesus passing by. She went down the steps into the cold water, came out, didn't suffer any ill effects. She got on a train. It was seven miles from the railway station to home. And she walked all those miles by herself. And as she was coming into the yard, her mother saw her coming. And her mother fell upon her knees and started to weep and cry and said, God surely must have healed you. And mom said, He sure did. He sure did. I felt His presence and I felt His healing power. Hallelujah. She said, I felt His presence and I felt His healing power. She only touched the hem of His garment as to his side she stole, amid the throngs that gathered around him, 
and straightway she was whole. Oh, touch the hem of his garment, and thou too shalt be free. His saving power this very hour will bring new life to thee. She came in fear and trembling before him. She knew a Lord had come, and peace that passeth all understanding. The mighty deed was done. Oh, touch the hem of his garment, and thou too shalt be free. His saving power, his healing power, will bring new life to thee. Hallelujah. Can you praise the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. God instantly and miraculously healed my mom from those recurring fevers. And for something like four to five years, my mom had excellent health. God blessed her and kept her almost in perfect health. And if God could do this for my mom so many, many years ago, He can do the same for you. He can touch you. He can heal you. And He can make you whole. Hallelujah. Now I believe if God has done something once, He can do it again. He was able to... After my mom was healed, mom and I got married. They left Norway and came to Canada. And all through those depression years, it was mom who had faith in God. Her faith never wavered. Her faith was strong. It was mom who had grace set at the table. It was mom who pressed for the family altar. We'd gather around the Word of God and pray together. It was mom's faith that kept the family going because mom had been touched by the power of God. Now dad was sort of a weak Christian. Up and down with no real victory in his life. But one day in 1956, my own dad had experience with God that totally transformed his life. You see, we were Lutheran. Hundreds of years back, the relatives had been Lutheran. And now the full gospel was coming our way. Salvation for the sinner. Healing for the sick. The baptism of the Holy Ghost for the believer. And the power of God to live a cost victorious Christian life. That's the full gospel. Amen? That's the full gospel. During the 1950s, God was raising up powerful ministries. Men and women who had faith in God, who actually believe that Jesus still can do what He used to do in Bible days. One of these men was all Roberts. We heard of God raised them up sent them forth to bring healing and deliverance to the people. We'd read this magazine, was told of great miracles that God was performing. And we believed it was true, because we knew that mom had been healed by the power of God. Now, Dad hadn't been feeling well. He had problems with his heart and with his gallbladder. He'd been going to a doctor, but he didn't seem to be getting any better. And one day, Dad turned to my mom and said, I'm going to start seeking God. I believe that God will heal me just like He healed you so many years ago. And Dad started to read the Bible. He started to pray. He started to call out to God. Every Sunday morning, Dad would get up early, wash, shave, brush his teeth, dress, sit down in a big chair beside the radio. At 7.30, in the morning, all Roberts came on over Yorkton, Saskatchewan. In those days, we didn't have hydro on the farm. We had a big, big wooden radio, three batteries hooked onto it, and the area went through the window and out to pick up the radio waves. How many remember those? We've got a few old-timers here tonight. A great big wooden radio, three batteries hooked onto it, and the area went outside to pick up the radio waves. And all this program came on, all the joy of sins forgiven. All the bliss, the blood washed, no. 
Oh, the peace that came to heaven where the healing waters flow. Oh, the joy of sins forgiven, this joy when a sinner gets saved. The angels rejoice. Oh, the bliss, the blood washed snow. Oh, the peace akin to heaven. There's a peace that passeth understanding when you get right with God. A peace that passeth understanding. You can lay down at night with peace in your heart. You know that everything is right between you and your Maker. And Dad was sitting by the radio. It was a third Sunday. He was reaching out to God, but God still seemed very distant and far away. And all of a sudden, this message that morning, if you want to know if God is real or not, just lift your hands toward heaven and ask Him to show you. In childhood faith, my dad had very quick childhood faith. In childhood faith, he lifted his hands toward heaven and said in Norwegian, Good, this do a richtig good. Seen my, seen my. He said, God, if you really God, and show me, please, please show me. And all of a sudden, when he prayed that prayer, something like electricity started to come down his fingers, into his arms and into his chest. It filled his entire being. God's presence filled his entire being. The glory of God flooded his soul. The Holy Ghost came upon him mightily. The Holy Ghost fell upon my death mightily. And he looked up with his eyes open. He saw a square pillar of fine rain standing above him. Square like a chimney. A fine rain standing above him. It was God's presence. The dad thought he was dying. Never experienced anything like this before. A Lutheran. Never been in a full gospel. A Pentecostal church. Didn't know anything about the power of the Holy Ghost. A dad thought he was dying. But praise God, he was just starting to live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It was just started to live. God miraculously healed Dad and baptized him with the Holy Ghost in his own living room. Isn't that wonderful? God still makes home calls. God healed him and baptized him with the Holy Ghost in his own living room. Within a few days, God was speaking a language he'd never learned. Magnifying, glorifying, praising, and honoring God. And that was quite loud. Can you just imagine what my mother thought? She'd never ever heard anyone speak with tongues before. But my mother was a good person. And God started to lay hands on my mother and pray for her to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And my mother didn't think she was good enough to be filled. She didn't think she was good enough to be filled with the blessed Holy Spirit of God. And one morning, my woke up. God's presence was all over her. And these strange words were coming to her. They came from within. They were bubbling up inside. And mom opened her mouth and started speaking to them. And to her utter amazement, this beautiful language just flowed like a river. Hallelujah. 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 God filled her with the Holy Ghost as she woke up in the morning. Hallelujah. Jesus said in John 7:37. He said, if any man thirst, he said, if you're thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth in me, as the scripture said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe in him should receive. Rivers of living water flowing out of us to bless other people, we need that, don't we? 
We need the rivers of God to flow through us. People are bound by the powers of darkness. We need the rivers of God to flow through us to bless other people. For one month, the Spirit of God rested upon Dad. All he wanted to do was to worship, to praise, to magnify God, to read his Bible, and to worship God. For one solid month, God's Spirit rested upon him. And at times when he prayed, when he prayed, he'd see the Shekinah glow in the house, like a cloud, like in the Old Testament. The glory of God filled the temple. It was God's presence. And time after time, the Spirit of God would speak to him. He was a farmer, and he'd come in to eat, and he'd lie down for maybe half an hour to sleep, and, and the Spirit of God would speak to him. At night, during the night seasons, the Holy Ghost would speak to him. And the Holy Spirit was always turning him back to the Scriptures. See, my dad didn't know the Scriptures. And the Holy Spirit was teaching him, reading him, and teaching him, and guiding him how to live the Christian life. The voice of the Holy Ghost can be very real, can't it? If you live close to God, God can direct your way. You don't always have to be walking around in circles. God can show you His will and His plan for your life. The Bible says the steps of a good man, of a good woman, are ordered by the Lord. God can direct your way. God can show you His plan for your life. Jesus said when the Holy Ghost would come, He would lead us and teach us and guide us into all truth. He would open up the Scriptures so we could apply them to our lives. There are two things that my dad couldn't understand. Number one, why had this happened to him? He wasn't a great church goer. Just Christmas and Easter. He wasn't a great church goer. He had really lived close to God. And number two, that it was easy and simple to receive. Just reach out and take it. In simple faith, reach out and take it. And then he realized it was because of the grace of God. It was God's marvelous, marvelous grace. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9, For by grace are you saved, through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You could never get good enough to get anything from God. It's not the works. It's by His grace that we're saved. It's by His grace that we're healed. It's by His grace that we're filled with the Spirit. It's by His grace that one day we'll enter into those pearly gates and walk the streets of gold. It's God's grace, God's marvelous grace. The first person that Dad testified to was his own doctor. They were good friends. And Dad told them, the whole story. How he'd been seeking God. How God's presence had come upon him. How he was healed and filled with the Holy Ghost. And how his life was changed completely. When Dad finished, his doctor took him by the hand and said, Mr. Solbrecken, you are a very lucky man. And from that day forward, my dad testified to almost every person that he met. It was very seldom that he let anyone slip through his fingers. Very seldom. He always carried tracks in his pocket. He could come into a store, just as we live in a small town like this. He could come into a store, there might be a dozen people there. He'd give everyone a tract, and everyone would accept it. God used to mightily to bring the light of the gospel to many, many people. God gave him a boldness, 
and a power to witness for Christ he never had before. If God could do this for my dad over 30 years ago, He could do the same for you. He can save you. He can change you. He can transform your life. Now I believe if God has done something once, He can do it again. If He's never done it once, He will do it again. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hallelujah. What was it that changed and transformed my dad's life? What was it? It was the baptism of the Holy Ghost, a mighty baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. He was talking about Jesus. He that cometh after me is mightier than I. Whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fire is in his hand. He'll thoroughly burst the floor and, and gather wheat into the garner. But he'll burn up the chap with unquenchable fire. It says he's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Many people are filled with the Holy Ghost. And they stop there. They don't go any further with God. They sit down in the rocking chair and take it easy. They seem to be satisfied. But what the church of Jesus Christ needs tonight is the mighty baptism of fire. The church has become so worldly. And the world has become so much like the church. You can't tell the two apart. God said, I want a holy people. I want a spotless people. I want a clean, a clean church. The baptism of fire is a deeper experience. It's a deeper experience. It cleans out all the sin the dross, the chaff, the wilderness, wilderness of your life. It burns out all those things that hinder the Spirit of God from moving in you and through you. It burns out all those unnecessary things that are in your life so the Holy Ghost can move in you and through you. You lose the desire to smoke and drink and curse and swear to commit adultery and fornication. You lose the desire to watch filthy movies, go to bingos and dances and play cards. You lose the desire for the filth and the lust of the world. You get new desires that are clean and pure and holy. Your one burning desire is to serve God above everything else. The baptism of fire makes you an empty vessel, a clean vessel, a pure vessel, a vessel that's ready to be filled with the glory and power of God, a vessel that God can use. Will you be one of them tonight? Will you be one of them tonight? You'll say, Lord, here I am. Melt me. Mold me. Fill me. Use me. You're the potter. I'm just the clay. Melt me. Mold me. Fill me. Use me. Lord, make me into a vessel that you can use. Will you make that your prayer tonight? Lord, make me into a vessel that you can use. Listen to Jeremiah 33, 3. God says, call unto me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God says, call unto me, call unto me, and I'm going to answer you. What is your need today? What you need from God in your life. 
The Bible tells us that when Jesus walked the sandy shores of Galilee, He forgave the sinner. He healed the sick. He cleansed the leper. He raised the dead. He gave peace to the troubled. And I believe if God has done something once, if He's ever saved a sinner, if He's ever healed a sick person, if He's ever baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, if He's ever done it once, He will do it again. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's never changed. He's still the same loving, tender, compassionate Christ He's walking up and down these aisles tonight. He wants to meet the need that's in your life. He's walking up and down these aisles tonight. Says, my child, what is your need? I want to meet your need tonight. She only touched the hem of his garment. As to his side she stole, amid the throngs that gathered around him, and straightway she was whole. Oh, touch the hem of his garment. If thou too shalt be free, his saving power this very hour will bring new life to thee. She came in fear and trembling before him. She knew the Lord had come and peace that passeth all understanding. The mighty deed was done. Oh, touch the hem of his garment. If thou too shalt be free, His saving power, His healing power will bring new life to thee. He is reaching out to you tonight. His saving power, His healing power will bring new life to thee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful tonight that we serve a Christ who is alive. Risen from the dead, is alive. He said, we're two or three are God in my name. He said, I'm right there with you in your midst. You know, we've seen God do some very beautiful things in our meetings. Not because of us, but because God's people have joined together in believing prayer. Like in the day of Pentecost, it says they were all in one accord. God's people joined together in believing prayer. And then God did some very beautiful things on the day of Pentecost. A few months ago in Weeble, Montana, a woman came into our Sunday morning service. She had a large ulcer on her leg. She said it was large. She said it was all red and festering. It had red streaks coming from it. We prayed with her Sunday morning. She came back Monday night, stood up and testified and said that all the redness had disappeared and the sword just started draining like everything. By the end of the week, she came and showed Jane and myself, it was right on her calf here, how the skin had grown over everything. Everything was perfectly healed and you couldn't see a trace of it. It had totally vanished. The skin covered the whole sore. It wasn't red or anything. She said, I know it was the law. In Mott, North Dakota, a woman was in our services, and it was the last night of the service, of our meetings, and we prayed with everybody to the altar, and we went down to the audience praying for a few people. The pastor was with me. This lady, she had a large, it was like a mole on the side of her face, probably the size of a silver dollar. It was dark brown and really ugly. I walked up to her and I said, Would you like God to take that thing from you? And she said, Yes. We prayed with her. And she said, From that night forward, it just started dry up and it just peeled off. And she sent us pictures, a nice letter, and sent us pictures, before and after pictures. And there isn't a trace of it in this side. It's perfectly healed. God can do beautiful things. If we'll trust Him, if we'll believe, if we'll open ourselves up to Him and say, Lord, I'm here tonight, God, and God, here is my need. Lord, touch me. 
Could we stand, please? For 50 years, Pastor Max Holbrecken has awakened the conscience of his audiences through the anointed proclamation of the claims of Christ who said, No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. The truth is, you are either for him or against him. You cannot remain neutral. Great costs are involved in spreading of Christ's gospel. Please consider investing in this ministry. Contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM, Box 44220, RPO, Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V1N6, Canada. been watching the Come Home to Jesus television ministry with Canada's preacher man, Dr. Max Solbrecken, who has proclaimed the word of God across the world for 50 years without fear or favor of man or devil. Ask for Canada's revival magazine, The Cry of His Coming, when you write. Invest in souls by supporting this end time ministry. Please contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM Box 44220, RPO Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V1N6, Canada. Oh, die again and cry.